in the lab. So before we even get started, um, this is, for those who don't know, this is LG Doucette from the first mint. I think it might be everyone's favorite NBA Top Shot related account and platform just for everything NBA Top Shot. So LG, I want to welcome you to the Find Your Breakthrough podcast. I appreciate you giving us, you know, giving me your time on your uh, oh i got i got plenty of time for you man i got i got plenty of time for you guys and i'm always happy uh talk about top shot i definitely don't chat about it enough all day <laughs> i can imagine i was like you know when i was planning this i'm like you know what me and lg are just gonna shoot the shit for 40 45 minutes and just keep it super chill um but before we do that and dive into anything for the people on in the lab platform and even you know people who listen to my podcast who have no idea who lg and the first mentor can you give a little introduction to yourself and the first mint yeah for sure so uh, i'll start with first mint so first mint is i guess a media outfit built around nba top shot which is uh if you don't know what it is then you're you're about to nba top shot being pretty much like the first fully licensed blockchain application um by a major brand they sell and enable people to buy and sell and trade nfts which are digital collectibles and in this case they are nba highlights you probably know all that and and you could probably figure that out on your own. So so the first mint is uh I guess like a, a network that I've created in the last couple of months where we cover NBA Top Shot in a somewhat traditional way, but obviously covering a very non-traditional product. So right now we've got a very active Twitter stream. We have um, three podcasts per week to just audio where I interview different collectors and guests, and then a Friday live show that gets a little wild sometimes. And we're working on a few other major initiatives where we're basically, our mission is to basically, uh, again, provide that traditional media coverage for something that that really has none right now. And then also to uh, educate people into the space, right? Because blockchain is not easy to understand. Even something like super fun, like NBA Top Shot has tons of complexities. And we want, you know, we want to help people feel like safe and good, especially, you know, this is an investment product as well. So some people are putting big sums of money in there, even small ones too is fine. We want people to help you. We want to help people feel good about what they're doing and help them make really smart decisions. For me, um, LG is my moniker for the name for the for the first mint. My real name is Luke, and by trade, I'm like an advertising executive. Been producing like TV commercials and content for a long time. Um, but this is by far way more fun than any of that stuff I've ever done. I, I can I can totally see that. What's what's the most exciting thing for you? about this whole NFT and NBA Top Shot space? For sure. Probably the most exciting part is, well, first of all, I'm a huge NBA fan to start with, right? And, you know, my interest in the NBA has wavered over time. Um, you know, being a Raptors fan, there's times where it's come and it's gone, but obviously the last like six or seven years have been really awesome. So that's brought me back to the NBA. And pretty much I feel like the NBA just really turned the corner when Adam Silver took over and they just got way more about player empowerment. They got way more digital. They have so many other digital arms, things that they're exploring, Top Shot being one of the latest ones. But also if you look at like the 2K League and some of their like VR initiatives with the Golden State Warriors, like they, they're so forward thinking that I just, I just love what they're doing as a league. And I also just love the product. I love watching the games. What excites me about this is that they are, as a, as a fan, it's for me, it's a totally new level of fandom. I never thought about being able to invest in these moments or, or, or really to invest in any way in an NBA product, you know, before you could spend your money on things, but those things that you would buy wouldn't really hold value. Like nobody, you know, if I buy a Kyle Lauer jersey for 200 bucks, like nobody wants to buy it for 200 bucks, right? It's like, it's, it's, I've worn it and it'll be worth like 50 bucks. So it's like, there's, there's no major investments I've been able to make in the NBA. I've never looked at my fandom in the NBA as an investment, but now I can, um, which is really cool. And then on the larger scale, what's really exciting is that in blockchain, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on. But a lot of the major brands and corporations have yet to find a breakthrough in terms of how to create a consumer scale product. And despite the, I guess, messy process of the last couple of months of bringing hundreds of thousands of people into NBA Top Shot, what I think it's doing is basically building a blueprint where many more sports leagues and brands and everybody will be able to follow in the years to come and build not the, you know, we're not going to see, I don't think if the NFL gets involved, I don't think we'll see top shot NFL. I think we'll see the NFL do blockchain their way, but it, I, it, I think they'll do it purposefully like the NBA has done and, and make something just as great. So um, yeah, that's probably the part that's most exciting for me is that we're, we're top shot is opening up a world of possibilities in NFTs. 
you explained that so beautifully and I can only potentially credit that to the thousand plus times you've had to <laughs> give something similar. So, uh, I like it. Uh, let's go back. Let's stay on the NBA for a second. Yeah. So obviously Raptors fan, you know, you're Canadian born, all that stuff is great, mm-hmm. but growing up, you know, where was the fandom then? Like, you know, who, which player did you idolize? What was your favorite team? Well, you know, growing up, I grew up like downtown Toronto, like, like very downtown Toronto. And so growing up, you know, we're, we're a hockey family and we all played hockey a lot. And when the NBA finally came to Canada, um, not just for exhibition games, but eventually announced the Raptors and the Grizzlies, that was really exciting. And, and that like, you know, let us convince our dad to finally get a basketball net in the backyard. Um, so that just kind of turned us in, in slightly more into basketball fans the years then were pretty rough. Like we had like Damon Stoudemire as like the really only one of the only stars. And then we kind of like a rotating, a rotation of like old veterans coming through the door for like some star power, but also for like grit, but it, you know, like Charles Oakley and stuff like that, but it, it never really coalesced as a team. Um, when the Vince came along, obviously that was super exciting. And and for those first couple of years of Vince Carter, it's like, I, th- I think a lot of people today, especially younger people don't realize that in those first couple of years of Vince Carter, like people were literally saying that he was the next Michael Jordan and they were serious. Like everyone around the league, especially at the dunk contest and even just every game, he was so impressive that people were like, oh my God, like this, this is literally the new Michael Jordan that we're seeing. Um, and then, you know, the next couple of years, I mean, he, he remained good, but never really ascended um, to that next level, but uh, still a really great player overall. So that, you know, through that and then through the decade of the 2000s, it's like as, as Raptors fans, our, our emotions um, <laughs> were, uh, went for a roller coaster ride, let's say, with Vince leaving and then a couple of years of mediocrity. And then we had Chris Bosh, but it wasn't really, he wasn't quite good enough to get us over the hump. And then he left anyways to go join LeBron. And it was just like really painful. So, you know, through most of my youth, it was, it was challenging to be a Raptors fan because just there wasn't much to celebrate. And at the same time, being a Leafs fan, there also wasn't much to celebrate. Like it was, it was, it was pretty bad. Like the mid two thousands were really bad time to be like a Toronto sports fan of any kind. Uh, even blue Jays were like total trash then too. Right. And we had like, there was like Roy Halladay and he would win a bunch of games. And then that was it. Like and we would win no other games if he didn't pitch them. So it was just like a brutal time for most of my youth, like late teens and, and early twenties to be, any kind of sports fan of any teams I love, but the last decade has like made up for that. Right. Starting with the Raptors kind of yep. uh, magically coalescing when they, when they tried to trade Lowry and it didn't work to the Knicks. And then somehow they started winning games and now Lowry's going to be the greatest Raptor of all time. Kind of a weird thing. I think people forget about that. We almost traded him to the Knicks and the Knicks said no. Cause they, they felt like the Raptors fleeced them when they traded RJ Andre Barnani over there. Um, it's kind of like a weird thing where we kind of like, though. like, it would have been a totally like a Raptors franchise is a totally different direction if that had happened. Uh, mm-hmm. That Ujiri is like one of his first moves is like I got to get rid of Kyle Lowry. <laughs> People kind of forget that, um, but it all worked out well. And you know we had a couple of years of playoff failures, which sucked. But you know we finally got over the hump with Kawhi, and and now there's a general good vibe around the team, even if we're not contenders this year. So I don't really know where I'm going with that. I'm just kind of talking about my Raptors fandom. But um, I've always loved basketball, and and I find in the last couple of years I've had just more reasons to love it, even beyond the Raptors. Um, another good example, actually, I'll tell you something too, like through top shot, I've actually grown a bigger appreciation for some of the stars, especially someone like LeBron as like, you know, a guy who was a Raptors killer for a couple of years. And for me personally, I was always like, well, he seems to kind of like take a lot of dives and complain to the refs too much. Like it's kind of annoying, but through top shot to realize how much people really love him and, and how important he is now to the game as, as one of the elder guys. And as really like one of the only living legends is still playing, um, I, I, it's really changed my appreciation for someone like that. Um, and also made me realize that once LeBron's gone, there, there is no current heir to the throne. There, there is no one else who is, who is, you know, the same way when LeBron came along, everyone was like, okay, once Kobe's gone, LeBron is the guy. Um, now we don't know who that is. So um, anyways, Top Shot overall has, has even accelerated my fandom of, of, of the NBA. It was a really long roundabout answer to your question. Oh, I love it. And I love that you're such, you, you bleed red, like the Canadian blood is inside of you. So oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's nice. It's nice to see it. Um, let's, so let's transition into NBA Top Shot. And yeah. uh, what, I, what, I want, what I want to start with when you're talking about this before we started the podcast, and just the crazy, you know, time it's been the last week and last couple of days, especially with just all the changes, the marketplace going in and out you know, limiting buyers to 60 minutes, 90 minutes, all that kind of good stuff. That's right. There's been a, there's been a lot going on. So I basically just wanted to get your thoughts on everything that's mm-hmm. happened. And then I also want you to answer the question that we were exposed to before the podcast is, have you been trying to collect the challenges? 
Oh man. Okay. Let's get, this is going to be a long answer. Cause you asked me like five <laughs> questions in one. Um, yeah, you know, I, top shot is frustrating and the, they, they throw up that beta tag. Um, and overall that's kind of like a, a weird, um, it's a bit of a weird quagmire for from from their end because you know they kicked off the season. I always say this: they kicked off the season by advertising with Tyler Hero, telling people to come into Top Shot, and then within three weeks, not because of Tyler Hero, but the advertising kind of backfired. Where suddenly they had too many people, and when those people came in and they're like, "Hey, why can't I withdraw? Why are there issues in the marketplace?" Top Shot was like, "Oh, it's beta, don't you know?" And that's the part I always felt was maybe a little mismanaged. But to their credit, it's like. Well, you know, maybe not to their credit. It's like, it's like, I don't know why you'd build a product thinking that people wouldn't love it, right? It's like, who builds a tech product not expecting or assuming that millions of people are going to want to use it, right? Like, that's, that is what you try and do. But whether the growth was faster than they expected or not, um, I think the most important part to, to keep in mind is that Top Shot is building for the long term and they will make decisions in the short term that are unpopular and they're aware they're going to be unpopular, but long term, they expect to have positive impacts on the experience, right? Like something the other day when they announced, okay, two hours per transaction um, or uh, one transaction every two hours for, for buying or for selling on Top Shot, obviously incredibly unpop unpopular because people want to buy right away. But at the same time, it's like a month ago, we were all complaining about bots. And even a week ago, people were like, I can't buy anything at any good prices because everything's getting just scooped up by people that are buying literally hundreds of moments every minute. Now that's not possible. So as much as that decision was unpopular, it's also allowing far more people to get access to the moments that they want. And I've been saying this for a long time and all the times that the prices have spiked on Top Shot, as much as it's nice for all of us who are in there and we see our account values go up, which is super fun, of course, we're making money. At the same time, it's like there needs to be a balance in this game. Like this, this at the end of the day has to be a balanced economy. Not every moment can cost three hundred dollars. It's that's really unsustainable. There, you're not going to get user growth when every when the most base moment of like I don't know the most random no name player costs three hundred dollars. If your favorite player is OGN Anobi or is I don't know uh, Kevin Durant, well that's that's a that's a high priced favorite player to have. But um, let's just say some other you know decent league player like Ananobi's a good example where he's like he's pretty good not an all-star but he's not you know necessarily a bench player every night you need to be able to buy OG Ananobi for like eight bucks like that you need to have a normal price point it can't be that the lowest OG Ananobi moment costs two hundred dollars or even sixty dollars we're not going to let more people in so what's happening now is we're finally seeing a shift where Top Shot is taking a bit more of a responsible approach they're slowing things down at the risk of pissing off a lot of current users but to set up a much healthier ecosystem. Like I actually thought the other day after they closed the marketplace for the entire weekend, I was actually telling a few people, I was like, I think they might actually just shut the whole thing down for two weeks while they completely retool everything. And that'll be really unpopular if they did that. But it's like, if they can say we're shutting down for two weeks and then after it's going to work perfectly, that's not the worst thing. So now they slowed it down a bit of a different solution, but so long as this product can work properly and that there can be accessible prices and there can be fair access to the product for everybody, then I think we're going to be in good shape. A month and a half ago, the biggest problems were the queue. And, and, and actually, there wasn't a queue. It was the pack drops. There's a total shit show when there was a pack drop. Now they came up with the queue system. Some people are unhappy. You line up. You don't get a good number. You're not going to get a pack. That sucks. But it's better than literally having 200,000 people refresh on the same site and the site crashing. So it's like, it's, so it's, they're working on it. And if you think about in two years from now, what the product will be, it'll be in absolutely great shape. It's just... I think we all love the product so much and everybody's so intense about it that, uh, you know, every single little decision is going to mi be micro analyzed. And honestly, every single decision, no matter if it's good or bad, some people aren't going to like it and, and they're going to let you know that they don't like it. So, so that's kind of just how it is. And every other major tech platform that we use, Facebook, Instagram, um, I don't know, Google, like, like every other major thing that you spend time in iPhone Every time those platforms do some kind of refresh, like they, you know, when Facebook changed the timeline to newsfeed, when Instagram changed the layout, tons of people are always so mad that they change it. Change is tough. So now when Top Shot appears to like move the goalposts of, of how certain things are done, it's going to be tough. Change is tough, but long term, I think they're getting set up for, for a much healthier system for everybody. Yeah, I totally agree. You said that beautifully. And I think like, yeah, the whole beta tag is fine, but I just feel like, it's just such at an early stage that the experience is only going to get better. And I actually think that from what I've seen, like, you know, the whole experience of lining up for the pack, getting that cue, the 30 second anticipation of shit, you know, am I going to get this? Like 
Yeah. They've done a great job with that. And, and I can only imagine that just getting better and better, like you said, over the next X amount of years. And once they work out these kinks, I think this is going to be one of the top platforms across all the sports because the NBA fan base and the community they have is just, is just so unique. So I'm just excited for it. And I think the team they have, I know they're, they're making more money. They're hiring new people. And I've always tell people like, just, just stay the course, man. This is, yeah. this is just the beginning, just weather the storm with everyone else. And you'll be so much happier a year from now, as opposed to you just quitting and getting out the game. We, we've never, I don't think there's really many times in the history of technology products where there's been a product that goes through beta in such a, a rough and clunky way with so many people demanding it so hard to the tune of 200,000 people and like $30 million a day on a marketplace. That doesn't, that's never happened. Right. So there is, there is literally no precedent for this. And that kind of has, if you, if you unpack that, it kind of has a few different layers. Like there's no precedent. So there's no one to look for in terms of saying, well, here's how they did it. This is how you should be doing it. There is no playbook. Simultaneously, there is no competitor either. So I will say, you know, to play devil's advocate, as much as I really do believe in the team at Dapper and Top Shot, don't fully agree with, you know, every single decision, but that's fine. At long term, I really do believe in it. I will also say that I think they're benefiting right now that there is no alternate option. There is no NFL blitz zone. There is no NHL center ice. There is there is no other very cool blockchain product that has a great marketplace of collectibles that are sports related and licensed. There is nothing else like that right now. And there won't be for a long time. So they've got this like long ass runway to get it right. And I think they will. And I actually think as a result, when they do get it right, a lot of those other sports brands and leagues are going to, are going to use that as a blueprint for how they do it. So let's say the NFL got on to get into this, got into this. The NFL is not going to do this like open beta with 300,000 people all trying to line up to get packs. And it's totally messy. No, like they're, they're going to properly build the product first, make sure it really works before they ever deploy it because nobody ever wants this, this, you know, the bad vibes that Top Shot has gotten. And unfortunately they're, they, they've put themselves you know, as, as the guinea pig for like literally what could be an entirely an enti like a billion billions of dollar industry in the very near future. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I feel like as this builds out over the next five to 10 years, every league will have this hopefully deployed. And this will be like one of the league, every single league's top revenue generator. It just going to be, you know, it's just going to create so many unique opportunities. Like I said, I don't even think we know how many um, ways that this product can actually be used yet. It's just going to be developed mm -hmm. over the next X amount of years, once they include yeah. VR, once they gamify, once they do all these, you know, like I said, one of the things I loved on Twitter was, you know, you walk into arena an, an arena and at the end of that game, you automatically get an, a moment from that game. And you're the, you're the only, whatever, 50,000 people who get it. I'm like, that's, that kind of stuff is so amazing to me to, to think about. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Because you also don't know what's going to happen in that game, right? Sometimes you go to a game yeah. and it's and it's kind of a dud and your team's playing a bad team and your team sucks anyways. And it's just kind of like a slow Monday night game. Other times you go to a game and it's like a player scores 60 points. And, or maybe, I mean, it doesn't happen often, but a player scores 40 points, let's say. And it's their, their first ever 40 point career night. And it's a very special moment. Um, and you could have that. And that's just like the tip of the iceberg of what else you could do once all your fans are have addresses on the blockchain where you can send them things without having to verify like anything else other than just their address. I agree. So let me ask you this. Um, I've seen the UFC. I believe they've signed. I think <laughs> NFL already has something yeah. working. Do you think that Dapper Labs will be the home? Because like you said, right now there's no competition. Um, I also love Dapper Labs. I love mm -hmm. what they're doing. I love the people behind it. Do you think that all, you know, these major sports leagues will turn to Dapper Labs to build and, and deploy the product? Do you think they could build it internally or will there be like a new competitor that comes out? That's a great question. I've gotten a lot of calls in the last couple of weeks, last couple of months from a lot of different people that I know who work in other industries who are like, I need to get in on NFTs. Like I've got friends who work in music and they're like, yo, we've got this artist. He's got like 40 million Instagram followers. He's huge. How do we start making him NFTs? And I was like, you got to take a ticket in line to work with the very few companies that exist that can do this. Yeah. So, or, and, and to line up to get in line to, to release on Nifty Gateway or on OpenSea or whoever else. Like it's, it's, there is a huge backlog. Like the space of NFTs up until three months ago is tiny. It's like a big high school. It's not hard to get to know to everybody. And even now, still, it's not. So as a result, there's a huge lack of infrastructure in the space to bring this demand on. So I think you'll see a variety of things happen. I, I think you'll see a lot of new platforms get built. You'll see a lot of new Dapper Labs type companies get funded and start to 
to do things. So I don't think, and as well as like just tons more creators and even just companies like ours, like the first mint where we want to be essentially like the ringer of, of NBA top shot or, or of the NFT space in general, um, you will see more, more just initiatives like that grow and get funded in the space. So in a couple of years, like if it's time to deploy the NFL version of the product, I don't know if it's going to be Dapper because right now I'm sure Dapper has gotten phone calls from literally every major brand, every major store of intellectual property that exists. Do they even have time to take those calls, right? And should they be doing that instead of responding to the tens of thousands of customer service emails they're getting? You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, it's a matter of priorities. Like they got to nail top shot first before they can even answer an email from the NHL or the NFL. You know what I mean? It's like, you got to nail this and prove to everybody that it can be done and it can be done well before you can then open the door, despite there being that gold rush. I think it's a fine balance where you don't want to turn away that business either. But again, like I'm saying, it's like there are no competitors right now. So there's only so many other businesses that are going to be able to do this the way that even Dapper has done it as well as they have. Um, one way or another, it's going to drive tons of innovation in space. And that's and that's what you want to see. So whether like everyone's saying like, oh, is the NFL going to have this for next season? Like, man, that's really doubtful. It took a long time to do this NBA stuff. Like licensing collectibles, like especially on this scale, that doesn't happen overnight. And building out a whole blockchain product, you don't just make, you don't just do that in like two months, man. Like this, this project was under development for over two years before it even launched its closed beta last July, right? It takes a long time to do this properly. So whether it gets done with Dapper or not, we will see it. Um, but I will say in general, for anybody who who thinks, who sees any opportunities in the space, whether you're a communicator, content creator, a developer, uh, entrepreneur, or whatever, now is the best time to get in there because everybody's trying to build in the space and, and you could be one of the pioneers of, of whatever it is that you want to build. I totally agree. And I love that you said that. Actually, I'm really excited to see what you guys turn into first mid. I know you're working on something. Like that again. <laughs> me too, man. Yeah, so. me too. <laughs> I can't wait to see it either. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's touch on this real quick because, you know, all these um, platforms, uh, Rarible, OpenSea, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of them. And there's going to continue to be a lot of them that come up. What's your thoughts on, um, you know, a music creator, a rapper, an athlete, whatever, just hopping on OpenSea and, for example, and just, you know, putting their store up and putting, you know, a bunch of NFTs on there um, as opposed to potentially maybe trying to work with a, a, a platform like Dapper Labs that's going to come up in the future and, and doing it that way? That's a great question. Um, I would say that that's kind of like the equivalent of, you know, do you want to, if you're a musician, do you want to put music out by yourself or do you want to go through a label and an agency? And you can be very successful as an artist now just making music on SoundCloud, but inevitably your goal is to be signed to a larger label, right? So the same way that this, it's like, yes, you can start to make your own stuff and we're very much in that in that world now of the creator economy right you have so many different platforms like patreon um and even you know only fans where like literally anybody who's making some kind of content as, as an artist or, or whatever else it is that you make um you have so many platforms that enable you to connect directly with your audience i really believe that that is blockchain will further enable that to happen um but right now again it's like i think a lot of people are going to try to go into NFTs as this kind of gold rush. Like yesterday, we saw Rob Gronkowski put out his own like cards, yeah. right? But, and we're going to see a lot of other people. And Lindsay Lohan was putting out some kind of NFTs a couple of weeks ago, or whatever. A lot of people are going to try and make those to kind of do a quick cash grab. But what I actually like that Gronkowski did, and I, and I was quite surprised he did this, is he actually added functionality to some of his NFTs. And in, and in, the, in the space, we call that utility where basically you want NFTs, like the true purpose of NFTs is for them to do something for you, right? So you're even saying like, let's bring it back to basketball. If you own, you know, the Dallas Mavericks NFT, their own NFT that they made or their, their ticket NFTs of, and you go to the game, the utility of that is that every time they win, you get some kind of new cool thing or you get access to some kind of new experience or you go to the game and you get an immediate moment from that game when you leave the arena. Like that is utility. And that's where we're going to open up a whole new world of possibilities of as a creator, if you're making NFTs, what are you giving to people? Not what are you taking? Not here's my drawing, buy it, and now I'm a millionaire. It's like, no, 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 no. Why are you making this drawing? Why should people buy it? And what's going to happen for them when they when they do that? You know what I mean? And that's that really is what the creator economy is. And I and I, I it's a bit crude, but I'll use I'll use OnlyFans as the best example that it's like. OnlyFans is is a way to legitimize legitimize something that is 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 seen as very illegitimate before, and it's a way to make make things a lot safer, 
But what that does is also it encourages the creators to give as much as they can to the people who subscribe. You go to OnlyFans, you sign up, I don't know, for whoever you want to see for like 10 bucks a month, eight bucks a month, whatever it is. You will subscribe to the people who are giving you the most content, who are giving you the best stuff. So in NFTs, we need to parallel something like that, where it's like you want to subscribe to artists and creators who have the most to give, not just the most to take. So that's kind of the paradigm shift I hope, I hope we start to see. So even in, in NBA Top Shot, same thing. Which, which, you know, if, if players start opening like fan clubs of, you know, whoever owns my moment is in my fan club, what do they give? And is that going to make you want to be in the Evan Fournier fan club way more than the Kevin Durant fan club? Obviously there's a huge, you know, gap in skill, but Evan Fournier is way better of a like community curator and does way more for his fans. You're damn well going to want to be in his fan club and not a better player. Right. So it's going to, it's going to shift like that. Right. I totally agree. I I think you hit on the, on that perfectly. We're in the creator economy. And if the right people use NFTs to build their community by giving rewards, FaceTime calls, fly this fan out to do this, then you're unlocking a whole new potential. I actually love the fan club idea because I could see like these guys, these NBA guys starting to compete to see who has the best fan club and who's flying more people to games or whatever they're doing. I think that just, there's just so many possibilities, man. And I love it. Um, and those and those fan clubs will be representative of their personalities as well. And right yeah. now, you know, also just in general in digital habits, we're seeing such a shift to people being part of communities more so than being um, viewers on a page, right? Like, like <clears throat> personally, like Facebook and Instagram to me, it's like, man, I'm getting like I'm spend so little time on those platforms now because I just you just watch. You don't do any, you maybe you comment, but you don't really watch. You're, you don't really engage. Whereas like. I spend time in like Reddit and Discord now and Twitter where it's like I'm actively participating and the culture of the places I'm on evolves every day. And that that's something that it's like once you see creators kind of start to leverage that, it's like it won't be it won't even be as much as like who's going to give you tickets to games. It's like no, like who do you want to hang out with? Like whose community do you want to be a part of? Right. And that's that's where we're going to shift, especially if we spend more time online. It's the pandemic. We're, we're making digital friends, all like reconnecting with people I haven't seen in a long time. Your your preferences shape your habits right now. Yep. So in terms of your fandom, it's like, yeah, if you end up being a little less of a fan of Steph Curry and a bit more of a fan of Damian Lee, because his discord is the hottest one there is. And it, and it speaks to most to who you are. Yeah. So be it. That's what will happen. Yeah. Man, it's exciting. I, I love, I love kind of the way you're thinking and, and the ideas around it. Um, before I forget, before we transition. Challenges. You want to talk about off. challenges? No, no, no we'll, you're we'll save challenges in a second. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, because I don't think I asked you even on our previous call. Yeah. Were you ever involved with, uh, with crypto kitties or oh, yeah, great anything question, before yeah. NBA Top Shot? Or was Top Shot the first NFT, the first kind of crypto play for you? You know, I have some friends who work in crypto who've been doing some really great stuff for a couple of years now, both in like decentralized finance and, and trading and NFTs. And three years ago, a few of them at least told me, you got to check out this crypto kitties thing. And I didn't. That's and I was like, I don't, I don't really get it. And I never even looked at it. And that's a huge mistake. And uh, fast forward to, you know, middle of 2020, where like most people, I had a little less work to do than, than I had at the start of the year, uh, a bit more downtime, let's call it. And finally pulled the trigger and committing time to learning how blockchain works and learning about what has been built there in the last couple of years since the last major boom. And very quickly discovered that NFTs were a thing and that they were super cool and that they unlock all those possibilities we're talking about. And then within that, that, a space realized that the the NBA Top Shot was the only truly licensed product that existed, and that also the product was super cool, and that it was just starting. So I I latched onto it, but it is by no means the only NFT project that I'm. I, it's definitely the one I'm most involved in, but I, I own a lot of other NFTs in in other very interesting projects. For yourself and the way you see NFTs growing in this whole blockchain world evolving, is there a certain market? or a certain type of product that you think is going to have the most potential, whether it be digital art, digital sneakers, maybe it is the NBA top shots or the NFLs. I am going to answer it, kind of go back to the last thing we were talking about. And I don't, don't take this personally. I think looking at it as which product will be best is not the way we're going to look at it. I think we're going to look at it from a community standpoint. 
I think it will be which community do you want to be part of most? Which one speaks the most to you, regardless of what the actual uh, product transaction is? I think that that's what's going to matter most because I think that that is, I think once we develop a, again, that creator economy and that these um, decentralized applications have a, their own ecosystem of value, I think you're going to see people migrate more towards kind of like the clan mentality of like, I want to be part more of this type of project and this type of people rather than, oh, it's the Disney NFTs and I need Disney NFTs. Like that is very like high level fluff for someone like Disney to get into it and start to roll out like Marvel and Star Wars and Disney vaults and all that kind of stuff. It's like, if, if they don't do it in a way where people truly benefit from it, if they only do it in a way of like, just buy more merchandise, like, you know, after Mandalorian, like I always joke about this. It's like literally the day after the second season premiered, I saw like baby Yoda backpacks at, at shoppers drug mart. And I was like, God, there's just more crap that they sell us. If, if they don't find a way to truly unlock value for people that are investing and buying the stuff, I think they will get left behind no matter what their intellectual property is that they're bringing to the table. That's what Top Shot has done super well is that it's like you can spend $400 on LeBron and literally the next day, maybe it goes down 20%. You can still sell it for what, like 320 or 325 or whatever 20% less is. Like you, you can still do something with it or you can still sell it. And later you'll be able to play hard court, which is the game they're developing. You'll be able to play with it. Um, and if, if these brands or whoever these products are, if they don't do that properly, I think they'll get left in the dust. And if they do it properly, they'll create a, a very tight and awesome community. So to kind of, I don't know, kind of answer your question okay. from a different angle. I think that that is what is actually going to be most important um, in terms of bringing that critical mass to different ideas. I love it. I think you hit it right on the head too. Like the, the way you explained that community is going to be so key. And like you said, not just coming out because we're Disney, like, Hey, we have all your favorite characters on NFTs, but more so like connecting with the audience and really giving a reason to go buy and collect that. So I love it. Well, that's it. And, and even right now, you know, you're a content creator. So you already understand that it's like, okay, cool. Like brands want to advertise on your podcast, right? They want to advertise with you guys in your stream. And YouTube is a platform that enables you to just, you know, YouTube can put whatever ad they want, or maybe you have restrictions or whatever in front of your thing. That's the way we currently do things. And that's totally fine. But I think what we'll see in the future is less so like you're the creator, here's your audience and what brand can can I put between to kind of like give myself the most money and use the audience at for their eyeballs as though they're the product, which is what all of social media is. I think we'll see a shift more to like, no, does, does this brand align with what, what our community believes in? Yes. Yep. And, and if the brand wants to come in, what value are they giving to everybody in the community? Not just the person making the content. You need to come and give value to everybody. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. I love that. It's basically not accepting everything that's thrown at you. Um, which a lot of creators do right now is more so being like, Hey, there's a brand opportunity. Let's make sure they align with the brand and, and our audience is going to want to buy that product. It's not like oh, we're a basketball company and let's do a popsicle the, ad, you know, like even top shots are a really good example. And obviously some people who might be new, haven't seen, you know, a huge uh, value account value or anything like that. But it's like, man, like, like top shot has created the NBA has created a product in top shot or licensed a product in top shot that has not only generated more revenue for them, but that has created a huge account value for thousands of people, right? It's like now I'm actually benefiting from being an NBA fan rather than just giving money. I'm not just paying for TV subscription for league pass. I'm not just buying jerseys and tickets and anything. It's like all that, all that money I spent on the NBA, I get nothing. I have nothing to hold on to other than just, it makes me love the team more. I, but I have nothing tangible at all. But with Top Shot, it's like, no, I can invest in LeBron. And then there's value there. I can, I can cash out and I have money. You know, I have more money than I did before. Like that, that again, it's like, that's something that no, no real brand has ever been able to do to actually give value to a community that they are lending their brand to. Absolutely. I think the marketplace they've built is, is just so powerful. Um, something random before I forget, have you heard of yeah. um, Omi, Omi coin, OMI coin? <laughs> no, I haven't. The reason I'm bringing this up is I, I've started, again, I'm just deep diving into cool. NFTs and really trying to understand yeah. everything. But Omi coin, OMI is something I've seen where they're now starting to scoop up a lot of the big franchises and, you know, mm. own the digital NFT rights. And mm. I feel like that's like the next big wave of things happening where you have all these companies coming in and they want to make sure they have the rights to Pokemon. And like you said, Disney right. and Marvel and whoever, you know, these, these brands may be. 
And it was just interesting, interesting. to me. I just wanted to bring it up to see. I, I think you're probably reading it right now uh, to see, but I just feel like there's, there's a rush, you know, Very cool. there's a rush to it all, right. To see who can, who's going to have this stuff, who's going to own the long-term value and which brands and figures or, you know, characters could, you know, allow these brands to make hundreds of millions of dollars that they didn't have. <laughs> totally. I, I think that, I think, I, I mean, this looks really cool. I don't know if these have any actual utility or actually give you anything uh, to buy them. And I'm not saying they don't, I'm not saying this is yeah, a, I don't know either project. Me. What I'm saying is that it's like, I think you'll see a lot of this stuff for the first couple of years yep. and then it'll be kind of like the tide has come in. And then when the tide goes back out, the stuff that'll stick, that'll truly stick is the stuff where there's communities that are getting value of some kind. Totally. So it's like, we're all going to buy all these crazy NFTs, like Batman and all this kind of stuff. Like I, there's so many that I bought like this as well. Like, I think we're going to, there'll be that gold rush for a while, but then over time, what will really stick is, is communities that have, that have like really cool and interesting value for the people in them. Right. So yeah. I hope these guys, I hope these guys can guide these brands through it. Cause this looks like they got some big names. They got some big names. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see what yeah. happens with that. I just thought that was interesting as I, uh, you know, yeah, very interesting. Very cool. Rabbit hole here. Um, let's transition back to some NBA top shot stuff and, pick the the brain of the of yourself so first thing like you sure. said we put it off for a bit but i just want to get your thoughts everyone has different thoughts on challenges are you doing them and you know what's your thought there's a lot of new challenges that have just come up so um it's hard to distinguish which ones to do because there's a lot of great players and a lot of people are very happy about this now actually that between seeing stars and rising stars the four rewards that are going to come out are all like really good, attractive players. You got Anthony Edwards for rising stars, followed by the Zion Williamson challenge. And then you've got Kevin Durant and then LeBron um, for, for seeing stars. So I think that's really exciting. I think that that's like a great service to, to everybody who's involved that those are the new challenges. Um, personally for me, you can never go wrong with LeBron. So that's kind of the, the seeing stars one is the one I've been circling. But at the same time, now that there's new rules for supply, right? We saw that release last week that there's new edition sizes. It's kind of like, well, how much do I want to pay for probably like a one of 4,000 LeBron? That isn't even him actually at the All-Star game. It's just like an All-Star game set, right? Um, so that's kind of the questions I'm, I'm rolling around in my mind. And also a huge thing to keep in mind here is that these challenges are long. They're three weeks long. So the LeBron and Zion challenge, they won't start for another like 18 days or whatever. So it's like you will, even to scoop up those moments now, you're going to have that liquidity locked in those moments for like almost two months, right? And what do you think is going to come out between now and the middle of April or end of April? What new stuff is going to come out that you're going to want or everyone else is going to want to get? If they do end up doing this run it back set, they've talked about another run it back set for a while that's going to have Shaq and AI and McGrady. It's like, man, those three alone everyone is going to want and is like, cool. Like, do you want to get another LeBron or do you want to just put all that money into Shaq? Right. It's like, it's like, you know, there's, there's kind of like an interesting twist there. Right. So um, that's, that's something where it's like, I am angling for some of those, but at the same time, I'm very weary of what else is going to happen because I don't know, someone like Lamelo is a really good example where it's like for a long time, he only had one moment. So it was very hot. It's a triple, triple badge moment. It's the only one he's going to have that's triple badge. That's cool. And then when everyone started, you know, when we, when they announced the master challenge for LaMelo, the cool cat, that was going to be his second moment. But now in between that first one and the announcement, and when that LaMelo cool cat actually comes out, by the time it comes out, there'll be like four or five of his moments out there, right? There's already, there's already a second one in rising stars. There's another one in the new base moments. Um, and there, he might have a legendary moment soon, right? So it's kind of like, it's one of those things where it's like, well, depending how long you're planning into the future, you got to keep in mind how much things will change by then. Right. Um, so that's kind of how I'm managing some of my investments right now, but I think, I don't think you can go wrong with some of the star players. No, hundred percent. Um, I like the, how about you? What do you, what are you, what are you going for? Yeah, man, I've, I've been trying to wrap my head around this, you know, and, you know, see what everyone's doing on Twitter. What are the, you know, the so-called experts doing? And I haven't mm -hmm. dove into a challenge yet. The LeBron one, obviously like, just like you piqued my interest. Right. Um, I just don't know what the, what the best thing to do is I have unopened packs, which I'm also toying with. Like, do I open the packs? Do I, do I huddle them? Like many other people are doing and hope for a potential value or do, do I just really enjoy myself and, and just go crazy and open them. And then I can use those to actually get these challenges. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm struggling with a few internal, internal things here <laughs> that I guess are a part of the strategy and whatnot. Um, yeah. but I am very interested in, in the LeBron challenge, but just like you, I heard about the run it back. And my mind has always been long-term. So, you know, obviously I scooped up some moments, I'm sure just like yourself recently, 
Um, there were some cheap mo- cheap ones. There's just there was an Eric Gordon dunk I just really wanted. So I was like, let me mm-hmm. just get it. It was a decent serial number. Let's just get it. Yeah. But other than that, I've been very wary on like, man, you know, I think there's more pack drops coming. I heard about the cool cat stuff. I heard about the running back. I'm like, I honestly rather go all out on on Shaq and 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 I grew up watching Shaq AI and, and T Mac. I had all of T Mac yeah. shoes. Yeah. You know, and so many people are thinking like me, like, yo, that could be, you know, depending on what moment gets minted, obviously. And whether it's on the Raptors or the Magic or whatever, Houston, I don't know what team it's going to be on. Um, could be, could be dope. Mm-hmm. So yeah, on the pack side, are you opening them? Are you holding them? Is there any strategy for you? I know I Kylo. Of, Kylo's. I have, a, I have a lot of unopened packs. You do have a lot of unopened packs. So, but you're mixing them. You're opening some and. It depends. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the new, like a lot of those like stress tests, like the few that I was able to get, I didn't open any of those. Interesting. Okay. So I still have even some of the stuff. I don't remember like mid January where you could still just buy packs like freely on the market. Um, and they would sell out in a couple hours rather than immediately. Like I, I picked up, like it was like, you know, base pack, like release two or something like that. So I still have like three or four of those. Um, but the longer it goes, you know, what's funny is that it's like, actually, I actually find the longer I go without opening it, the easier it gets. It's like abstinence, right? It's kind of like, you know, you, you know, like people in the winter, like quit drinking because they drank too much during the holidays. Yeah. And it's like the first couple of days are like, man, I really want a beer. But then by the end of January, you're like, I don't need a beer. Right. It's like, it's like a weird thing like that, where it's like, it's like the longer I go now, the more I'm like, yeah, you know what? I don't need these packs. Like, <laughs> it's like, so it's, it's kind of like a weird thing. And I, and I'm really hoping that someday soon, maybe before the end of the year, they roll out that like unopened packed selling feature, yeah. um, which I'd be all over. Cause I'd be very curious to see what these can command on the market. It, it, like literally out of pure curiosity. Um, Cause I've got a few from series one that I haven't opened. Like I've got like one or two like early adopter packs um, oh, wow. okay. and uh, a few, a handful of like premium packs from like the early drops. What, what's the favorite, what's your, if there's a way to say this, you know, what's the, your most favorite moment that you own right now? Is there one? Is there a way to be like, this LeBron's my favorite or this Luca is my favorite? That's a great question. Um, I think I think there's definitely been a few times where I've looked at my collection and thought like, what is the last one I would ever sell? Yes. Like, let's say I decide, you know, which I, I don't intend to really do this anytime soon at all. But let's say it's like, okay, you know, once a month I have to sell one of the high value moments I have. Like, what's the, what's the one at the very end of the line, not only that I think could be worth the most, but also just the one I'm most emotionally attached to. I would say it's probably the Luca first round moment. I got it. It was one of the first packs I ever bought uh, from the actual first round set. It's his game winner over the Clippers. Um, And that was the first time it, it has, it hits a few different notes for me. That was the first time I opened a pack and I got one of the better players in that set right? I'd opened like a throwdowns pack and I got like Serge Ibaka. You know what I mean? It's like, that was one of the first times it was like that first round set is like, no, there was two main players you wanted is either LeBron or Luca. And I got the Luca. These numbers are going to hurt for you. The pack cost $24. And at the time, the Luca, after you opened it was selling for 70 and I almost sold it for $70 worth of Ethereum at the time. uh, And I didn't. And now that moment I think is like 20,000 bucks. Um, but that's the one that I was like, this is a cool moment. It's his first and only appearance in the playoffs so far. Uh, it's a game winner, which is really cool. And it's series one. It's one of 200, which is cool, uh, which is now basically considered legendary. It won't be changed to legendary, but that's pretty much what legendaries will be minted to that is at least, you know, a couple hundred. And yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing where it's like, it's like if Luca does develop into an MVP level player and becomes, you know, if he, he's probably the closest to being the heir to the throne in a way. So if he does become that, it's like, well, that, that moment will be worth more than almost any other. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, that's the one I'm probably most attached to. Okay. I love it. What, what's your thoughts on, you can, you kind of touch on it. Like obviously some moments for those who don't know, every moment has a certain amount of, uh, of that moment circulating. It's a certain serial number. Mm-hmm. 500 to 35,000 now what's your thoughts on and obviously as demand grows they have to make more moments they have to more they have to mint more some of the moments got changed to 35,000 plus what's your thoughts on you know the moments going higher in the in terms of the amount that are circulating around the world i mean i mean it's very necessary right and again like a huge part of that is to make some moments accessible we need to be in a point where even legendary moments are accessible. So the, no, no matter the mint count, 
people still need to feel like they can get some really rare stuff or some or legendary or whatever right. for like a somewhat decent price. And not every legendary moment costs 10,000 bucks, right? So if somebody really wants to splurge and they want to get a very rare Zion, like they can still do that in a, in a somewhat reasonable way. I, th I think it was always going to happen. And at least we still have the series one stuff, which will always be like one of 49 or one of 50. There'll always be a scarcity um, to some of the moments. So I think, I think overall it's healthy. And I think honestly, like if people are worried that it's like, well, like if, if, if I gave you, you know, if you go back to like actual trading cards, if, if, you know, in top shot, maybe, you know, 5,000 LeBrons seems like a lot. Right. But if in, in normal trading cards, like if I came to your house and I gave you a card that was LeBron and it's a really cool one. And I was like, yo, there's only 5,000 of these in the world. You would hold it and be like, this is pretty cool. Like this just, I feel like one of 5,000 out in the world is pretty rare. It's just a little bit different in top shot because you can see who owns every single one. So it feels, it feels smaller in that way. Um, but at the same time, like in terms of how many people might eventually be on Top Shot, it's nothing. It's really nothing to be a one of 5,000 or even a one of 10,000. Totally agree. Because I just feel like once this gets opened up to more people, and like I said, I don't, I'm sure there's people using VPN in China and there's a small amount, you know, like I said, Kylo from India and there's other people out there, but yeah. I don't think the world really knows what's happening yet. And I think once it gets open to the masses, this will become a big thing because like basketball is universal. And there's mm -hmm. so many basketball fans, you know, everywhere that are going to want a piece of certain players or certain moments Absolutely. to build you know, their collection. So mm -hmm. we're definitely still on the ground floor, which is exciting. Did you get started in, um, in January? Is that when you said, or were you no, there no. before that? You were, where, no, I got in, I got in like mid September, mid -September. Like early okay. September, you're, you're yeah. early in, which is, yeah. which is super lucky. Okay. Um, in terms of this, this is a question. I don't know if you've heard, but. I'm very high on one day. I'm, I'm sure it won't happen until the beta tag has been fully removed from top shot. This platform is just good to go. Um, but when do you envision seeing like a Kobe or, you know, some Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, some things like that making their way onto top shot? I think it might be a while. I think you saved the best for last. And I think that's what top shots done yeah. really, really well. Um, I've been on some, you know, clubhouse chats where uh, some more notable sports people, have said that they don't like any of the highlights on top shot because they they it's not a you know a 1992 michael jordan game winner and something like that and i my rebuttal to that is like well if that was the first card that was ever out of the first moment the game would suck because you can't have you know it's it's kind of like if you can it's kind of like you go to an ice cream shop it's like if you literally get the be best flavor right away you'll never want any of the other ones but if you have to start with the worst flavor it's still ice cream it's still really good and you slowly work your way up to the best one, right? So that's kind of like an easy analogy. It's like, yeah, if there's ever like a, if there's ever a Jordan game winner, it's like, don't release that for like 10 years, at least like take your time, take your time putting that out. Like that, that will be the ultimate one, right? That will be the, the pinnacle of the, of the whole thing. So if you put that out right away, then it's only downhill from there. Totally agree. Love the analogy with the ice cream. <laughs> it's still ice cream even if it's like the weird like lime yeah. the weird one that has a weird name at baskin robbins like yo it's still ice cream at the end of the day it still tastes great so don't you know it's kind of like do the reverse and i actually think that's where a lot of other um branded nft projects have kind of uh done not so well is they've started with some of the best stuff right it's like i think you need a slow roll i think that's what dapper knows how to do really well is to slowly make people more and more uh, in, in intense and addicted to a product. What's, what's the one moment if it came out right now and who cares what the price is, you're a billionaire and you can buy it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you want that to be? If you can hand pick that moment, is it like a Vince Carter dunk contest? Is it mm -hmm. something with Kobe? Like what would just make you the happiest man in the world? Well, I mean, I mean, most recently, I think probably like the Kawhi game winner is like a really easy pick. And because that's another Martin. great Raptors moment that transcended all boundaries of basketball where everybody thought that was amazing. But actually, you know, what's funny is that you're kind of tapping into a bit more of the emotional side of me for basketball, where the moments that I actually like more are not necessarily plays. Um, like, you know, one thing I, I talk about sometimes on Twitter and even with just friends is like the moment I really want to see is I want them to do like a reaction set. And I want the Shaq filming Vince Carter during the dunk contest. Not, not oh, just Vince wow. Carter's between the legs, but you know what I'm talking about yeah, where Shaq has like the little camera, video man. camera and he's like, you know, that one, it's like, I want that, you know, cause that to me 
is like that was so important again as the you know Raptors fans feeling like they need to be relevant yeah. Raptors need to be relevant kind of thing it's like yo Shaq is so blown away by Vince Carter like we've definitely made it because now we have an actual relevant mega star right so that even is kind of significant and I'd say the other similar kind of like reaction is at the end of game six of the Eastern Conference Finals the Raptors against the Bucks. Um, when the Raptors like lost the first two games and then won the next four to go to the finals. And it was like, there was like 30 seconds left in the game and you knew the Raptors were going to win at that point. Like they were up by seven or eight points and like Kawhi was going to shoot some free throws or something. And there's like a quick, like one or two shots of Kyle Lowry where he like, he's like looking up and he's just like, you can see how happy he is that he's going to make it to the finals. And it's like, if I could just cut that out and make it into a highlight that I own, like that would be it. That would be it. Cause that, that, that clip of him is how is honestly how we all felt. I totally agree, man. What? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was so happy for Kyle when that happened. Um, and if you're not and happy for all of us, right. It yeah, really just, represented all the, the everything we've gone through. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that, that it's like, yeah, that's, that to me is, is a bit more what basketball is about is kind of like the, the not, not necessarily the emotion of the play, but the emotion before and after the play. I agree. I love that. I hope that that idea gets brought up sometime because you know, thinking about the Shaq, well, just thinking about some of the great moments we've had in the NBA, yeah. even some Shaq to the fool things I could see being on there one day, mm-hmm. like could be great. And like I said, playing with the emotional side makes collecting it so much more fun. Yeah. Thank so, you. Awesome, man. So look, I'm excited about everything. NBA top shot. Uh, I feel amazing to have the opportunity to kind of sit with you again sure. for an hour of your time and just chop it up about different things. Hopefully in the future, we'll do some more. So. Um, I want to kind of try something different with you and just see yeah. you're extremely well-spoken. You know, uh, you're just well educated. Like I love the way you present things, the analogies and the terminology used behind it, and so much more. I don't want to sit here and gas you though. But um I want to end the podcast with this. Do you have a quote that you know that you live by? Or even if you don't have a quote, maybe a strong piece of advice that you know you you believe in that could help the listeners or help anyone along their path in life. In general or in, in NFTs and like top shot and stuff. Actually, I will ask you this. If you have a general one, I would love to hear it. And if you have one specifically for NFTs, that would be a bonus. Oh, man. Um, I'd, say it apply, I, I'd say it applies to both. Okay. And it kind of relates back to what I was saying about that, you know, Top Shot not having MJ or Kobe moments for a long time is that I, I really think that great things come to those who wait. I really think that that really some of the best things come in life when you can be patient and, and wait for it to happen and to not to try to force things too hard. Um, I think that that, yeah, I think that that's probably it. I love it. Simple, simple. And yeah. Good advice. Um, before we end off here, if you can just let everyone know where to follow you and where to for find sure. in the first mint. Yeah, for sure. So you go on Twitter and you find at the first mints pretty easy to, uh, to find. Um, so we post a lot of information there. And then if you listen to podcasts, you want to listen to podcasts about NBA top shot, you can find us on Apple, uh, or on iTunes and Spotify and any other podcast platform. Same, same name, first mint, the first mint. I do want to say two things before we end off here. I'm excited for you yeah. to do more video content and oh, thank explore you. that Avenue. And I want to give a, a shout out to your audio engineer. I, I don't know his name. I saw the tweet the other day, but man, you have one of the crispiest sounding podcasts that I've heard, even, even among some like celebrities, to be honest. And it just, yeah. it really does make the audio experience that much better. Thanks, so man. Kudos to you guys for- That's, uh, that's my guy, Jesse from Ottawa right there. Yeah, he's, he's killing it. So we give him a big shout out. Yeah, he's, he's really propping us up. So I, I definitely appreciate him. And it's nice to hear that from you as well. Likewise. So man, thank you again for your time. Like I said, make sure you guys follow him and, and everything at the first man. They're doing a lot of cool groundbreaking stuff around NFTs and NBA Top Shot. If you're watching the podcast, you made it all the way to the end. Drop a like, hit that subscribe, follow for more. We have a lot more content coming out.